And that is Glasgow Coma Scale. But with the Glasgow Coma Scale, you don't have to learn it by heart. You should just know a bit what it is. And basically, the Glasgow Coma Scale means that, and it was originally meant it for trauma. And it was because the, the, the people didn't know the neurological terms and, and didn't know what is sopor or stupor or what is what is coma. So rather, uh, this was like made for general public, but uh, and also for doctors to sort of have a same language and to understand how the patient looks like when someone when a paramedic comes to a car and there's someone with decreased consciousness that the other doctor on the other end of the line phone line basically gets the idea how severe the state is. Okay, that's the, the that's the reason. And now they use it for everything, but originally it was for for scoring the the consciousness and basically what you test is eye movement remember it's about eyes and this is not important and you can find it in, in anywhere so I, I won't waste time on that and it's eye mouth so speech speech and limbs and limbs are actually the most important ones all of them have different grades four five and six and in total if someone is lucid, he has 15. If someone is in deep coma, he has, that's the least, three, okay? So you test eye movement if he spontaneously looks at you, etc. But it has, as I said, many drawbacks, especially you cannot use it for poisons and for metabolic disorders so well. For children, you can lose it. And for someone who's intubated already, so he won't speak, okay? So it has many drawbacks, okay? So that's Glasgow Coma Scale. And I will rather run to important part. And still, over here, the, uh, let's go through causes of like long-term unconsciousness, okay? And I have a mnemotechnic for you, opiate. Opiate for you. And these are the causes which will cause longer, not like temporarily, like temporary loss of consciousness, but longer term. So remember, O is oxygen, oxygen. P is poison. I is, it could be again, intoxication, or this could be psychiatric. A means acidosis. T means trauma. E means, again, epilepsy, because you can have, for example, status epilepticus, okay? S stands for stroke, typically, and U, uremia, okay? So this is a mnemotechnic. This is a longer, prolonged, prolonged, loss of consciousness so if it can be hours or days or months or years okay and now let's get to the interesting part and that is brain death brain death okay and i told you that the brain death is defined by the death of the brain stem that's important and you know what? This is why you are testing brainstem all the time in patients. And it's a very serious protocol where, where the patient has to be off any opiates, any drugs. And what do you test? How do you test the function of the brainstem if it's working or not? First of all, if patient responds to you, no need to test the brainstem. But by what you test the brainstem? And you test it, I said it already, by the brainstem reflexes. And... So basically to know if the brain is dead is to remember the six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 
12s. So remember the nuclei. Basically, if someone is without any opiates, all the brainstem reflexes, like in me and you, should be working. And if the brainstem is fine, although maybe my both of my hemispheres are dead, still the brainstem reflexes should be fine. And the idea is you should not be able to elicit a single brainstem reflex to continue with evaluation for brain death. So, yeah, once you are able to elicit one of these reflexes, you forget about, you know, sending the patient for transplantation or turning off the machines, etc. Okay. And remember, you know the reflexes, I'm sure. So in the mesencephalon, you have the papillary reflex. Okay, so everyone knows what's that. And then you have the then you have the vertical oculocephalic reflex. That is when you move with the head and the eyes should stay fixed on one place. Okay? But over here you move with the head vertical. With the pawns you have horizontal oculocephalic reflex. So you move it horizontally with that and it should be fixing. If it's not fixing, it's the doll's eye sign. If it's not working, it's negative, but normally it should be elicitable. And then you have a corneal reflex. You touch the cornea and the the person should close his eyes immediately. Okay. And then we have oculovestibular reflex. reflex okay and then you have a that's the last one in the pons and then you have two main reflexes that are in the in the oblongata oculo cardial reflex and gag reflex okay yeah so and the gag reflex is the deepest reflex. And that's when you put a tube into the mouth and the person starts to gag. And none of them should be elicitable. Okay. And there are other tests. But what I want you to understand, when you're having a stroke or the brain dies, it, it dies in rostrocaudal way. So, so the brain dies. First, the hemispheres dies by the increased pressure and then the, the brain stem turns it off. So... If you want to send someone for transportation or whatever, and you want to know if the brain is really dead, you test the brainstem reflexes. There should be no brainstem reflexes at all. Two doctors should do it. Okay. Then other test you can do is the hypercapnic test. That means you turn off the machine, uh, the ventilator, and there should be no way that the person will take a small breath at all. Okay even a small movement. There should be no movement of the spontaneous movement of the lungs. Okay. So you turn off the machines and hypercapnic test means he is not breathing. So the CO2 goes up and this is a strong stimulus for the brainstem to start breathing. And basically if it goes to 60 millimeters of, and no movement is seen, it tells you there's no reaction of the brain. So you can stop the hip hypercarpnic test right away. And then what you do is you send the patient, you know, he's not breathing at all. That's very important. No brainstem reflexes at all. And then, of course, there's going to be a spontaneous heartbeat because, you know, SA node can beat easily without anything. Heart can basically beat two, three days without any control. Okay. If you keep the ventilator and everything on. Okay. So no ventilation, no brainstem reflexes. And what, where you will send them is to a, another evaluation, and that is an evaluation of the perfusion of the brain. And there are many ways. In, in all the times, there was only one way how to do it, and that was by angiography. And what I want you to know is that you are looking for stop flow. And stop flow means there's no flow of blood into the brain. And why? 
because the brain is so edematous that the vessels got collapsed, compressed by the increased pressure that is intracranial. So you should remember that, you know, the CPP is a central perfusion pressure and that means perfusion in the arteries, mean artery pressure minus the intracranial pressure. And normally intracranial pressure should be below 20 millimeters of mercury. But over here, as the brain dies and gets edematous, the pressure, parenchymal pressure increases. And when the ICP is higher than NMAP, all the cells collapse. And there's no way how you can get a contrast liquid into the brain. And that's why you see stop flow. And this you can do by angiography classically, but now you can do it with scintigraphy, with CT angio, MRI angio, and watch out, in small children, you can also do Doppler sonography, okay? Yeah? Remember, angiography, crucial one, that's what you do. Uh, like, this was the only thing, but recently they also allowed scintigraphy and also CT angio, but everything has a similar or MRI angio. In small children who have open fontanelles, you can do open fontanelles, you can do Doppler. Okay, but anyways, everything is with the same aims for one thing, and that is stop flow into the brain. And this tells you obviously that the brain is dead. Okay, good. And last thing, very fast, is the table. So we're going to put if he's awake or aware of himself and we're going to put locked in over here we're going to put locked out we're going to put coma and we're going to put brain death okay and we're going to put eye we're going to put sleep awake cycle So eye movement, sleep, awake cycle, like controlled movements. And sp spontaneous breaths, breathing. And look at locked in. So locked in means he's going to be awake. And he's going to be aware. Okay. He has thoughts. He's locked in. Eye movement is possible in some cases. Sleep awake, it's possible. Cycles. There, there could be controlled movements if we mean the eyes. Okay. Yeah. Only. Eyes only. Eyes plus eyelids. And spontaneous breathing. Yes. If the brainstem is fine, you're going to have spontaneous breathing because the yeah, if the lower etages, if the oblongata is fine, you're going to... Locked out, how is it? So, you're going to be awake, but you will definitely not be aware of yourself. Eye movement is possible, yeah. Sleep, awake, yes, they're having... But is there a controlled movement? We don't think so, no. It's not like... that. It's not controlled movement by... It's his frontal cortices. And spontaneous uh, breathing pattern is present. Okay. What about coma? Well, not awake, not aware. No eyes, no eye movement, controlled eye movement. Sleep awake, no, he's in coma, no controlled movement. And spontaneous activity typically is present if the brainstem is okay, which should be. Depends. Well, and death, that's easy. Nothing. Brain death. Okay? So remember this table and basically that's it. That's the, the, the most important thing for you to understand. So thank you very much. And see you some other time. So, thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.
And as always, check the description below for supplementary questions and other materials.